The Canadian Signal Corps was the Army Corps of radio technicians and radio operators who set up lines of communication for the Army. For this reason, my father, Jack Hill, and fellow signalmen, Bob Keswick, Sergeant Bob Reed, Sergeant Lenny Gaysford, and Ann MacDonald left Ottawa on August 7, 1942, and headed to posts in the Yukon and Northwest Territories. After leaving Fort McMurray, Jack and Sergeant Reed boarded the Radium Queen, pushing two barges down the Mackenzie River. On August 27th, Jack and Sergeant Reed board another boat, the Radium King, with Sigmunds R. Keswick and C. Christensen. The men actually slept on the barge that was being towed. The following day, the barge was passed on to another boat, the Northern Prospector. On August 30th, they are in Resolution, where Jack meets Dave Patrick and the two of them board the Radium Express and head to Fort Norman. The Army personnel at the fort at this time were Jack Hill, Dave Patrick, Carlisle Christian, Ross Glover, and the cook, L. Lofting. If we were review the group photo of Reverend Cook and the Anglican Hospital staff. I suspect the couple in the front row on the right to be Dr. Harvey and his wife. And Mrs. Harvey is securing Mabel Morris on her right, and perhaps Francis Smith is beside Reverend Cook. The only person I am really sure of here is Reverend Cook. Jack frequently mentions spending time with Dr. John Harvey. He would escort the doctor by dog sled or boat to medical calls in native communities plagued with tuberculosis, whooping cough, and the flu. I tried to research the doctor online, but came up empty. In October, Jack mentions giving Corporal Cecil Horn a haircut. At some point in September, Ross Glover is transferred from Fort Norman to Norman Wells. Cecil Horn seems to have been transferred to Fort Norman at some point after Ross Glover's departure. Jack mentions Cecil Horn and L. Lofting making homebrew in December, so Cecil seems to be a permanent fixture there. One person of interest Jack met at the hospital was Cece Hodgson. She was a young local native woman who was working at the Anglican Hospital. Cece had told Jack about some Wolverine pelts that were for sale. Jack bought two of them, and Cece made Jack his first parka. She also made him some mucklucks, and at Christmas gave him a shirt she had made. Later in life, she became Chief Cease Hodgson McCulley, and died only fairly recently. Jack also knew her father, Hip Hodgson. I believe he was taking mail to and from Norman Wells for the troops. But this is one of the last mentions of Hib until May 27, 1944. At the beginning of July 1943, Jack comments that there are 12 cases of flu at the hospital, nine cases coming from Good Hope. On the next day, Jack says there are more cases of flu at the hospital and we are now treating patients in their homes. On the third day, Jack cites more people are getting sick all the time. He notes whites aren't getting the flu. Fortunately, he doesn't mention any deaths, and this was the last entry on the subject. I found it interesting how much social interaction there was there in the community. Jack either had people visiting him, or he was out visiting people's homes, or the hospital, or the mission. The visits usually involved card games or board games. He played table tennis at the Mission. They had football and baseball games and dances at the Hudson Bay Company. Or they would go visit a native drum dance. In the winter they skated, skied, and toured the area on dog sled. There was lots of coffee, tea, or hot chocolate, and cake or cookies being shared. Lots of dinner invitations, and lots of hunting and fishing excursions. Another person Jack mentions meeting in July 18th of 1943 is R.A. Davies, who is a reporter for the Toronto Star. He spends the night at Fort Norman and leaves the following day on the Mackenzie River boat going to Aklavik. Meanwhile, C. Sargent is leaving Fort Norman for Edmonton. Jack and C. spent time together at the station before she left. Later in 
June of 1943, Jack meets Jay McCauley, and I believe this to be James McCauley, Cease's future husband. Also in June, Art Harmon joins the station with Gord Wright. Another cook named Johnny Law also arrives. I don't know if Johnny is in any pictures, but Art Harmon has a brief cameo in our last film clip. West Territories had oil resources the Americans and Canadians were tapping into, and it was considered an important part of the war effort. Meanwhile, in the news, Canadian soldiers are getting a 20 cent a day raise in salary. Also in July, Jack mentions the NFB National Film Board sent two people who were staying with them at the station. Dave Patrick and Jack had their pictures taken for the National Film Board Canada Carries On series. The name of the reporters were Jim Beveridge and Don Fraser. I contacted the National Film Board archives hoping to find the pictures. They were very helpful, but we did not find them. I did see a film of the boat trip into the Northwest Territories. It would be very similar to my father's experience. For that much, I was grateful. It provided me with insight into the journey. On August 27, 1943, Jack visits with Joe Dillon. Joe received 11 stitches after being rifle butted by Ernie McDonald back in June. The two men were trappers, and this was a dispute over trap lines. Trapping was lucrative during the war, with some trappers making 5000 to 6000 a year. Big money in the 1940s. Later in September of 43, Joel Dillon and Ernie McDonald went to court concerning their dispute. Ernie got a one-year jail sentence, and Joel got a $25 fine. There's just no explanation as to why. That's all he wrote. Just as a side note, Jack mentions he bought a Wolverine pelt for $16. He uh, notes only eight pelts around town this year. Also in August, a U.S. Army plane crashed two miles downriver. On August 30th, Pilot Meeks and crew were forced to stay at Fort Norman because of weather. They stayed with Jack at the station and left the following morning while the weather was still nasty. It was snowing and windy and their wind touched the water. The plane flipped over. The mechanic drowned while four others were rescued. They sat on the pontoons while the W.L. Taylor boat did the rescue job. Jack was amongst the rescue team.
At the end of 1943, Jack has been talking to Colin Campbell, he, who he refers to as the interpreter. They talked about starting a cub pack at the mission. Jack was involved with scouting prior to the war, and Colin was enthusiastic about the idea, so Jack wrote Ottawa, and they registered a scout group with the blessing of the mission. So in January of 1944, Fort Norman registered their first cub pack, and perhaps the first native cub pack in Canada, although I don't know, I don't have proof of that. Also in January, Jack and Carlisle are given notice they will be promoted to corporals. In February, the first cub pack meeting was held and eight native kids joined up. So Jack refers to Colin Campbell as the interpreter and mentions Joe Hall as the assistant cub master. So I assume Jack was the cub master. When I was a child, Jack was often starting up cub packs and radio clubs. In August, another person of interest shows up. Cassie Lynn arrived. August 22nd to marry Carlisle Christian. Now one gets the impression they barely knew each other. Carlisle is, as dad quotes, quite pleased with Cassie, and they get married. Now they need a place to live. Back in April, a man Jack only knew as Old Henry was found frozen in his home. Since Carlisle was marrying Cassie, they took possession of Old Henry's house and started their new life there. They had two chimney fires the first week they moved in but they survived the winter and Cassie is several months pregnant the spring of 1944. Jack is transferred to Good Hope before the baby is born. That's a good job. In February, Jack finds himself getting more familiar with Good Hope and talking with Bill Carson, who I believe is the radio operator for the Hudson Bay Company. Jack makes a couple of medical trips to assist Dr. Harvey in Good Hope, and when Jack's promotion comes through in the spring, he finds himself assigned to Good Hope to set up a new radio station for the Army. So this is where the story of Fort Norman ends for Jack, and the story of Fort Good Hope begins. If you want to follow Jack's story to Good Hope, just check out my YouTube channel, or Google Good Hope Northwest Territories 1944. Uh, there are several pictures and a short 16mm film that takes a walking tour of the community.